so many countries are run by, by, by the left, it's also showing that the people of Latin America and the Caribbean, we are still struggling against U.S. imperialism. In the next years, either the Global South, we are going to keep being under the domination of the Western powers, or we're going to raise and we're going to try to build a different world, a multipolar world. China e Brasil, principalmente, eu vejo nós, nossos dois países como líderes desse sul global e da criação dessa nova narrativa. A gente, tá mãe, a gente tem tamanho, a gente tem talento, a gente tem capital humano, a gente tem conhecimento, a gente, a gente tem respeito mútuo um pelos outros, que eu acho que é o que marca, a, é o que diferencia a relação entre a China. Quando falam que a China é colonialista, eu acho engraçado, né? porque a China não se mete e nem não tem doutrina morro na China. A China não se mete em assuntos internos de ninguém. Eles, os imperialistas querem que a gente permaneça com a cabeça baixada. A gente que, como sul global, tem que se unir e impor a nossa própria narrativa. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talk It Out with me, Li Jingjing. This show aims to show you the different voices and the stories that are often neglected by the Western mainstream media. October 30th was a big day for Brazil because Lula, who was the former president of Brazil and the leader of Workers' Party, defeated the far-right incumbent leader Bolsonaro. Esta não é uma vitória minha nem do PT, nem dos partidos que me apoiaram nessa campanha. É a vitória de um imenso movimento democrático que se tornou, que se formou acima dos partidos políticos, dos interesses pessoais, das ideologias. Para que a democracia saísse vencedora. This is not just a historical moment for Lula himself as the former president of Brazil. Uh, this is also a historical moment for Brazil, Latin America, and probably the rest of the world as well. Are we one step closer to multipolarity? Are we one step closer to a new global order? How will Lula's win change the relations between China and Brazil? We will discuss all of this in this episode of Talk It Out. And to understand the views from Brazil, I invited two Brazilian guests who are currently in Beijing these days. Uh, they are on set with me. So I will start from here. So the, my first guest today is Marco Fernandes. He is a researcher with Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. Uh, he actually was on my show before to discuss BRICS, uh, but last time he was living in Shanghai, and now he moved to Beijing. So that's why we can have a face-to-face -face interview. So happy to have you back, Marco. Thanks for having me here again. It's a pleasure. And also, my second guest today, I'm very happy to introduce her, uh, Iala Vidal. She is the journalist with Forum magazine based in Brazil, but she has been visiting China since this summer, and she also covered the recent biggest political event, the 20th Party Congress in China, and me as well. So we were both at the Party Congress, actually. So later, we will discuss her experience covering uh, the Congress in China and visiting different places in China and see China for herself. But uh, first, Yala, welcome to the show. Ni hao, thank you. <laughs> it was such a tight race because Lula got 50.9% 50, 50. 9, 9 of votes. Bolsonaro got 49.9%. I know you guys are big supporters for Lula. You guys are both from the left. So I'm just wondering why you support Lula so much. What does Lula's win mean for Brazil and Latin America. So how about we start with the lady? Yes, uh, I will talk in Portuguese. O, o Lula vai encontrar um grande desafio. É, além de encontrar um país dividido, ele tem grandes tarefas pela frente. Ele vai precisar reposicionar o Brasil no cenário global. Ele vai precisar enfrentar a fome de 30 milhões de brasileiros, que é talvez a principal tarefa dele. Ele vai ter que pacificar o país, né? ele vai ter que conviver com uma frente ampla muito diversa, porque para realizar essa primeira tarefa de vitória, ele precisou criar uma frente ampla com pessoas da esquerda, da centro-esquerda, da centro-direita e da direita democrática. 
Então foi um grande arranjo político, uma grande construção política, tem até um, uma curiosidade. O vice-presidente do, do Lula, o vice, é, foi, já foi um, um adversário político dele, que é o Geraldo Alckmin, né, que já foi governador de São Paulo por várias vezes. E a nossa expectativa é que vai, ter, vai dar muito trabalho, ele vai ter que ter muito jogo de cintura, porque a partir de fevereiro ele vai encontrar um Congresso Nacional extremamente conservador, com a maioria do, dos novos membros, né, dos novos parlamentares de direita e apoiadores do Bolsonaro. Mas o Brasil é um pouco complicado e eu tenho, a gente tem muita esperança na habilidade política do Lula. Ele é um grande construtor, ele é um grande democrata, mas a gente não espera um governo puro de esquerda. A gente primeiro precisa reconstruir as nossas, a nossa democracia, as nossas instituições democráticas, tem tarefas muito amplas, né? E reposicionar, arrumar. Eu acho que é, é isso? Você acrescenta mais alguma coisa, Marcos? Não, eu acho que isso é. Eu acho que você summarizou perfeitamente. Eu acho que a necessidade, como a Yara estava dizendo, é que há tantas tarefas urgentes, como like mais de 30 milhões de pessoas estão morrendo agora, não têm comida. And even half of the population right now is it's, uh, suffering for some kind of um, um, food insecurity. So it's really a, a, a terrible moment for the country. So for these urgent tasks, I think Lula will have maybe, it will be easier for him to address some of them. But for the bigger tasks, this would be a big challenge uh, for Lula and for the whole government. É, e, e, assim, tarefas concretas também, sabe? A gente, a gente vai encontrar um país, além de dividido enquanto povo, desmontado no que diz respeito à possibilidade de desenvolvimento. A gente destruiu, a gente não tem mais indústria, né? A gente precisa de um grande esforço, é, não só do Brasil, mas como todos os vizinhos também da América Latina, que o Marcos pode falar melhor, sob a liderança do Lula, que de fato é o único líder popular, é ele, Bolsonaro, um extremista de direita, capaz de unir o país em torno de um projeto nacional de desenvolvimento, que é o que a gente precisa. Actually, both of you mentioned a little bit the, the crisis that people are suffering from hunger, from poverty in Brazil. And I, th I think we read some from the news as well, the rising uh, people in poverty, the rising uh, crime rates, um, the, the economic crisis, the climate crisis, the Amazon forest. So, but uh, of course, uh, I haven't been to Brazil yet, so we don't know how true those reports are. So I think no one understands better than you guys who actually lived and from Brazil. So um, can you talk a little bit about uh, how the economic crisis and environmental crisis are in Brazil, how, by, how bad it is. É grave e ela tem um nome, chama-se neoliberalismo. É, é uma questão de uma escolha econômica que nem mesmo os governos populares do PT, a despeito de políticas sociais, políticas de inclusão, o Lula tirou o Brasil do mapa da fome, ainda assim nós continuamos seguindo a cartilha de Washington o consenso de Washington neoliberal. E isso acabou gerando uma série de, de problemas, de, de, de atrasos, e aí isso se reflete na sociedade. A gente tem uma sociedade extremamente violenta, uma, uma sociedade extremamente racista, estruturalmente racista, misógina, e que, com uma classe média perversa, infelizmente, uma elite também violenta, e que vai ser um, 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 um caminho difícil, mas é um caminho que tem que passar por, por rever as escolhas neoliberais que o Brasil fez a partir disso. No que diz respeito ao meio ambiente, o governo do PT ele promoveu a construção de todo o arcabouço de proteção ambiental, que foi destruído pelo governo Bolsonaro. E a gente também tem que entender que o declínio do Brasil nos últimos tempos ele tem um marco temporal, que foi o golpe contra a presidenta Dilma. E tem todo um contexto internacional de interesses estrangeiros no nosso país, de uma operação é, cheia de, de low fair, de más práticas jurídicas. Lula acabou sendo preso 
por conta disso. A presidenta Dilma foi afastada, uma presidenta honesta, que hoje a justiça já já, já ela, ela nunca fez nada e mesmo assim foi afastada. E isso tem, a gente está vivendo um período de retrocessos de conquistas populares. A gente teve uma contrarreforma da, na Previdência e Assistência Social, a gente teve uma contrarreforma trabalhista e tudo isso é um pacote junto com uma crise no mundo também. Acho que é mais ou menos por aí, né? É um, é um cenário grave, a, a, nós somos esperançosos, a gente sabe que a tarefa é grande, é, é complicada, mas nós somos capazes de superá-la. Yeah, and I, I would add also, in terms of the current crisis we're living, um, also I would add the tragedy of, of COVID in Brazil. Because, um, as you know, I mean, Brazilian, Brazilian President Bolsonaro took the same line as Trump, first like denying the, 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 the gravity of the situation, mm -hmm. and, and also uh, delaying the purchase of vaccines. He, he delayed for many months, and at the end of the day, today almost 700,000 people died uh, for COVID. So Brazil, for instance, like is 3% of the population of the planet, but we are responsible for 11% of the death uh, for COVID, of total death in, in COVID. So this shows how bad the situation was in Brazil. And of course, we're talking about 700,000 people died. It's not only uh, disorganized the economy, but I mean, people's lives. This is like millions of people were affected by, by the death of their parents, their kids. So it's, it's really like a, a, a tragedy that we never lived before in the country. So I think that if you add all of this economic crisis, the climate crisis, the destruction of Amazon, as Yara was saying, plus the tragedy of COVID, this is really it's probably the, the worst situation of our history. And this also explains how, why so much, so many people, 60 million people voted for, for Lula. But yeah, like Lula got 60 million votes. Uh, but as we mentioned earlier, the data is like he got like 50.9%, but still Bolsonaro got 49%. It's, I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. So, I mean, the, uh, and also we can see the, even though um, Lula gave the speech and also got a, a congratulations from world leaders, from Biden, from other leaders in Latin America, also uh, China's president Xi Jinping, still uh, Bolsonaro has yet to concede and we can see his supporters are showing their anger on the streets. I think that basically means people are very divided in Brazil. They have very divided opinions. Um, you mentioned how necessary it is to have some leaders to represent the working class to solve this poverty, hunger issues, but still why are there so many people supporting Bolsonaro and what led to this division? Well, that's, that's a big question. It's a one million dollar question. This is actually, I mean, if you see, this is a, is a global trend of the so-called liberal democracies is this polarization. Many countries are living this. Even if you take the last elections in Latin America, most of them are also very tight. It was very tight in Colombia, it was very tight in Chile, it was very tight in Peru, and now in Brazil. In Brazil, I think the, the most um, concerning thing is that, as, as you were saying, I mean, there's a lot of people supporting Bolsonaro. And actually, Bolsonaro was able to create a kind of a movement, a, a far-right movement, um, a little bit similar like, like Trump did. Um, and of course, this movement, they are not going uh, away, even Bolsonaro losing the election. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a terrible combination of social media, uh, many sectors of the, uh, the evangelicals, the evangelical churches, plus big sectors of middle class, the white elite, and even uh, big sectors of military, of the armed forces. So all of this together um, <laughs> makes a, a, this, this a sort of like a, a, a movement that actually turned the politics into like a hate uh, issue. So you don't, you don't discuss politics anymore. You just hate somebody who uh, disagree with you. That sounds a lot similar to the trends happening across the world exactly. in the United States, of course. Exactly. And I think that also was in China when 
there were huge uh, protests, protests, and actually turned to riots in Hong Kong mm -hmm. of, uh, in uh, in 2019, exactly. right? So yeah, that's like it's a global trend. And, and this and this is uh, um, this sort of like method that they have to uh, use the hate as a as a as a narrative as a tool for politics. It's also what making the country so polarized. Because, because now it's, it, I mean, it's not only, it's not, not political, you don't have more political adversaries, you have enemies. And you have to destroy your enemy. And you have to kill your enemy. I mean, there's many cases in the last months in Brazil on people being murdered by political uh, discussions. Apenas de esquerda que morreu. Exactly, Left, leftist people were, were killed, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, um, and because also Bolsonaro did, um, did a law to make easier to uh, buy guns, more or less like the U.S. culture. So now you have hundreds of thousands of people armed in Brazil and, and, and hating people who, who disagree with their visions. So, yeah, it's true. I mean, the situation is very worrying right now. For instance, you said, I mean, Bolsonaro still didn't recognize the defeat. Actually, we have news from Brazil. There's lots of uh, blockades in highways in the whole country happening right now. Even like uh, yesterday, the International Airport of Sao Paulo had to cancel many flights because they were blocking roads close to the airport. And there's looks like there's more to come in the next days. So this is something that, I mean, it's a very tense moment right now. And we don't know, we still don't know what's, what's going to be, uh, what's, what Bolsonaro will do. But looks like they are planning something. So we have to be cautious and, and yeah, we don't know. It's very interesting because uh, Lula is from the left wing uh, and uh, so Brazil now as the largest and the most popular economy in Latin America has a left wing leader. The whole Latin America is l turning left and why this is happening and uh, what does this mean for whole Latin America? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, first of all, I would raise, uh, it's, a, it's a historical moment because, for instance, this is the first time we have the six biggest economies uh, of, the, of, the, of the region, Latin America and Caribbean, uh, run by the left. Mm -hmm. So it's Brazil, it's Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, Venezuela, and Chile. This mm -hmm. is the six largest economies. Mm -hmm. But you also have, as you said, uh, Bolivia, Honduras, and even Cuba. So, um, and it's also the first time in history that we have, uh, Colombia has a leftist uh, mm -hmm. president. Mm -hmm. It's the first time. And even Mexico, last time Mexico had like a leftist uh, president was like maybe in the 30s of last century. Mm -hmm. So it's really a special moment in, in Latin America. Um, I would say there's many reasons. Of course, I mean, in all the countries, there also polarization. It's not that uh, there's a big hegemony of the left. I think still, like countries like Argentina, for instance, there's a lot of political tensions now. Um, even we're talking about Brazil, Colombia also the same because it was also a tight election. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's really a uh, a moment where the continent, the region, is polarized. But even though the left is, is it's running most of the countries. So this is very interesting. The, the second thing is that, very important for us, is that it's the reorganization of the CELAC, which is the community of Latin American Caribbean states. It's our original platform that was actually created um, uh, a few, I mean, in the 2000s uh, by, by Lula, when Lula was president, by President Kirchner, President Evo Morales in, in Bolivia, the Cuba, President Chavez in Venezuela. But this platform in the last years lost strength because of the, some of the right-wing governments that took power in the region, especially Brazil. Brazil actually uh, uh, left CELAC in 2019. And since then, CELAC was actually not meeting anymore. So that was very interesting that last year, that was of, uh, led by President López Obrador from Mexico and also President uh, Fernández from Argentina. They, they reconvened CELAC in Mexico City. Uh, that was last year. And now there's a meeting scheduled for December or maybe even January uh, in Buenos Aires, which will be a historical meeting because now you're going to have Lula back, 
you have Petro, you're going to have Fernandez, Obrador, and all the other leftist presidents. So CELAC for sure would be uh, reorganized in the next year. And it's also interesting historically because next year, 2023, is the uh, 200 years of the Monroe Doctrine, the so-called Monroe Doctrine from U.S., mm -hmm. let's say America for the Americans, but actually for they themselves. Mm -hmm. It's going to be 200 years. And I think it's also very symbolic because the fact that, again, so many countries are run by, by, by the left, it's also showing that the people of Latin America and the Caribbean, we are still struggling against U.S. imperialism. And, and next year probably will be next chapter and, and that we will try to, uh, 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 of course, reorganize CELAC, but in this new context of geopolitical tensions everywhere, U.S., NATO, Russia, China, and the role that Latin America and Caribbean might have next year, it would be most likely very, very strong in this new geopolitical uh, context. So I think it would be a very interesting year for, for the whole region. You mentioned the Monroe Doctrine. I was just wondering, we actually discussed some of this in our last uh, talk. Sure. So like, because we see this, uh, China and Latin American and Caribbean countries have a lot of business deals, cooperations, and, uh, and then you see on the Western media, um, they've been warning countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, like, don't work with China. China is colonizing you. Or this, they are warning their own politicians, they say, oh, China is coming into our backyard. How do people from Brazil or from, from Latin America see the role of China and the West? É muito viciado, né? É um, uma maneira, é um, uma ferramenta de guerra, uma guerra híbrida contra a China. É, inclusive, a minha vinda aqui na China, a gente começou a construir uma rede de jornalistas do Sul Global, porque não é só contra a China, é contra o Brasil, é contra o Sudão, é contra a Argélia, é contra todo o Sul Global. Eles, os imperialistas querem que a gente permaneça com a cabeça abaixada. Então, nós temos que tomar as rédeas, eles vão continuar fazendo a narrativa imperialista deles. A gente que, como sul global, tem que se unir e impor a nossa própria narrativa. Então, é o esforço que eu, como profissional, faço no Brasil, de mostrar a China como ela é. A China tem problemas? Tem. Mas não os problemas que são apontados e da maneira como eles são apontados. E são problemas muito semelhantes ao do, da, do meu país. Então, eu acho que tem solução, é o caso de nós tomarmos as rédeas da narrativa sobre nós mesmos. China e Brasil, principalmente, eu vejo nós, nossos dois países como líderes desse sul global e da criação dessa nova narrativa. A gente, tamanho, a gente tem tamanho, a gente tem talento, a gente tem capital humano, a gente tem conhecimento, a gente, a gente tem respeito mútuo um pelos outros, que eu acho que é o que marca, a, é o que diferencia a relação entre a China, quando falam que a China é colonialista, eu acho engraçado, né? porque a China não se mete e nem não tem a doutrina morre na China. A China não se mete em assuntos internos de ninguém, ao contrário dos países do norte global que estão sempre querendo dizer, como o próprio Lula fala sempre, toda vez que a gente está saindo, está tá, tá despontando, eles arrumam algum jeito de detonar com a gente. Então, eu acho que mais do que um problema, é uma oportunidade para a gente fazer mais isso que a gente está fazendo aqui. We have big expectations also uh, regarding the relationship between Brazil and China now with Lula back uh, in power. Because, I mean, Lula, the Workers' Party government, both Lula and Dilma, made huge progresses in the relationship with, with China. Well, first of all, they created uh, together the BRICS in 2000, 2009. They uh, also created uh, the, um, the, the, the forum China CELAC, which is with the whole, all Latin American countries. This was President Dilma with uh, President Xi Jinping already. They, I mean, even the BRICS, they had this, uh, a few years after they found the BRICS, they were able to establish this partnership, which is the New Development Bank, which is here based in Shanghai, the so-called the BRICS Bank, uh, also President Dilma and, and President Xi Jinping. So, and of course, the trade between both countries had a huge increase in the last, in the last 20 years. Uh, 
But the problem is that, of course, with Bolsonaro, this relationship was actually broken politically. There was no more relationship. Trade was still there. Actually, the trade is huge. For instance, last year, the trade between Brazil and China was $135 billion. And actually, Brazil has a $40 billion surplus with China, which is very rare because most of the countries in the world, they, they actually have a deficit with uh, China. Brazil is actually, uh, it's only Australia and, and South Korea and, and the region of Taiwan that have uh, surplus with, with China. So Brazil has, in terms of trade, uh, it's, a, it's, a good, it's good for Brazil. Um, but at the same time, there are some challenges in this uh, relationship in terms of trade. Mm -hmm. uh, talking first about uh, economics. So the trade between Brazil and China is based, what Brazil exports to China is basically commodities now. It's uh, soy, iron ore, um, oil, crude oil, mm -hmm. and, and meat. Mm -hmm. This four is something like 87% of the total exports from Brazil to China. And Brazil imports, of course, manufactured products, different kinds of. This is, of course, it's, it, for Brazil it's good, but it's not enough. Because as we know, commodities, they first is a very concentrated sector, so it doesn't generate a lot of jobs. It, even the jobs that generates are not like qualified or high qualified jobs. So at the end of the day, for the economy of a country, for the people of that country, it's not enough to have only to only export commodities. Of course, Brazil will, will keep doing that, and China needs. So of course, it's a win-win, should be a win-win relation. But also for Brazil right now, as also Yara was mentioned, we have a big um, challenge uh, in the next years, is to reindustrialize the, the, the country, the economy. Brazil needs to, because uh, I will tell you one, one data. So in 2000, do you know what was the main um, export item uh, for Brazil? It was air jets. Brazil was a major exporter of air jets from Embraer, from the national company. If you go to the US, most of the short flights in US, I don't know, between New York and Boston, New York and, and Washington, are made with Embraer Brazilian jets. Mm -hmm. So that was 2000. So what happened in the last 20 years, as Yara was saying, it was, uh, I mean, the industry of Brazil was dismantled. And now what is the main uh, item for Brazilian exports? It's iron ore and, and soy. So this is, this is clearly, this is a regression for our economy. So this is the biggest challenge we have ahead. And having Lula back and with the good relationship that Lula built with the Chinese government, with the CPC, we also believe that we can have a better partnership for both sides. And what Brazil needs right now, we badly need, is more technology, transfer of technology. And this is what China have a lot. So things like, things like uh, this electric vehicles, and I would say especially collective vehicles for our big cities, uh, the renewable energies that China is the global leader in terms of technology and investments. Um, we, 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 there's, I mean, so many uh, things in industry, infrastructure, infrastructure that we need, uh, high speed trains, more roads, everything now that China has a big expertise. So these kind of things that we think that Lula could, and, and we're sure that we, he will propose to China. I'll give you one more example is what's happening, some deals that Argentina just made uh, with China. Mm -hmm. Argentina just uh, joined BRI yes. recently with big investments, but even before that, Argentina made, proposed to China many deals, and China accepted many very good deals for the country, especially in, in terms of infrastructure, of, of transportation. China is redoing all the, the highway, the, sorry, the railway system of Argentina. Uh, hydroelectric plant, and more interesting is the deal that they, they did with the nuclear uh, power plant. So Argentina will have a new nuclear power plant. Uh, China is funding, it's $8 billion. Argentina will have eight years to start to pay. And guess what? With Chinese technology, and the technology will tra be transferred because 
China also had just mastered the, the Hualong, which is the, the nuclear technology, and they would transfer to Argentina. And this would be a state-owned company in Argentina. So this is the kind of deal that Brazil has... We need. We, we need, and, and I mean, there's no way that the economy like Brazil, with a president like Lula, we cannot propose this to China. And I think China is, is showing to the world, as in this case of Argentina, guys, let's, let's talk. We can have better deals for everybody. It's a win-win cooperation. If this is a colonize, I would. <laughs> and I remember sharing, sharing this clip uh, that the former Chile ambassador to China uh, discussed... Jorge Jaime. Yeah. He said the differences between, because every time American cabinet came to Latin America, they talk about China. But when China, every time China cabinet, cabinet came here, they only talk about trade deals, corporations. They only talk about business. But every time Americans came here, it's, they only talk about China, China, China. Everything is China. So, but even though uh, they brought up Latin America so often and uh, they've been warning Latin American people, rarely do they ask what the people in that region want. A gente quer desenvolvimento, prosperidade, uma sociedade moderadamente próspera. Né? Nós estamos no sul global, a gente precisa superar a, a, a condição de países no capitalismo periférico. A gente precisa superar o neoliberalismo. São tarefas grandes e que a gente precisa de ajuda. E eu não consigo ver... É... Eu vejo com muito mais problema o meu país ter vendido a, é, 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 empresas estatais do que a China ter comprado. Né? A questão é o que, que eu quero, o que, que o meu país quer para mim. E eu nunca vi a China se intrometer nos assuntos políticos do Brasil. Agora, se está disponível para venda, vai comprar. Business. <laughs> Normal. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, we know, know the history. So it's, it's ridiculous that U.S. at this point of the history is saying that China or Russia is a threat to Latin America and the Caribbean. Because, I mean, we know our history. We know how many times, how many coup d'etat they organize. And I think you know what's colonization. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. What is imperialism? What is colonization? I mean, how many, I mean, they have, I think, 12 uh, military bases in, in, in South America and, and, and in the Caribbean. U.S. have. I mean, China has no military bases in, in our continent. Only Colombia, for instance, they have seven bases in Colombia. So when they go there, Blinken just, just came to Colombia to meet with Petro and to say, hey, watch out, China is a threat for you guys. And it's like, what? You guys have seven bases here in our country and China is a threat for us? Come on. Come on, Anthony. Come on. It's a train. A train for China. It's a threat. So it's, it's, it's ridiculous. With, with actually, what is, what is actually the big threat that China represents uh, to United States and to the Western powers. As the other was mentioning, because for the first time, maybe in the last decades, we from the Global South, we have an alternative to them, an alternative to IMF, an alternative to their way of doing business, which is basically coming and exploiting our resources. And when sometimes we do better and we have maybe a, a president who is more progressive, they come and they organize a coup d'etat and they take this president out. So for the first time with China, we, we have a possible partner. Of course, there's a lot of, I mean, contradictions, there's a lot of challenges, there's a lot of things that have to improve. But even as we, we saw in the last, uh, the Congress of the, of the CPC, one of the, for me, one of the most important things that are in the, in the report are first the criticism that China uh, is doing uh, regarding the Western way of modernization, which was based in colonization, in pillage, in exploitation of the peoples of the global south. China is saying we are uh, looking for our development, but we doubt this because we, we don't agree. We were victims also of this, so we cannot do the same. So this is the first thing. And the second thing concretely, you can read it in the report. China says we are committed to narrow the gap between the South and the North. Mm -hmm. So, of course, if, if you are in the White House and you read that, you're going to freak out. 
I mean, this, of course, this is a threat for, for, for somebody sitting in the White House. Oh my God, these guys are denouncing that we destroy the Global South to be rich, and they are proposing to be an alternative to the Global South? Oh my God, we have to stop these guys. So this is what actually is happening right now in, in, in the globe. It's so, it's so clear. I agree. <laughs> Since we talk about China, uh, Yara, I really want to ask you because uh, you, I think you arrived in China since June. You've been to many places across China, uh, across Beijing. You covered the 20th Party Congress with me. I was one of the reporters covering this event as well. I envy you guys. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I saw Xi Jinping. <laughs> <laughs> So can you share with us some of your experience as a foreign, foreign correspondent covering this major political event in China? How do you feel? Tem dois aspectos. Primeiro como profissional, como jornalista, eu faço isso há 30 anos. Então foi realmente um, uma oportunidade de ver a história sendo feita, porque foi um congresso histórico. Né? É, eu confesso que eu ainda estou digerindo as palavras do presidente Xi Jinping. E, mas as palavras dele me deixaram, deixaram muito claro por que a mídia ocidental cobre a China do jeito que cobre. E tem muito a ver com o que o, o Marcos falou agora. É por medo e porque não entende, não consegue entender a dimensão da, do, do, de a gente viu a história sendo feita. Como jornalista, para mim ficou muito claro o porquê a mídia ocidental cobre a China do jeito que cobre. A mídia ocidental não entende a China e o Ocidente tem medo da China. Tem medo da autonomia da China de ter construído o próprio caminho de desenvolvimento. É um país do sul global que não está alinhado ao consenso de Washington, não é liberal e conseguiu crescer. Isso assusta. A segunda é eu, uma marxista, filiada ao Partido Comunista no Brasil, assisti, eu fico até arrepiada, né? Porque, para mim, como pessoa, foi, uma, foi muito impactante. E, assim, eu estou muito curiosa para ver como que as tarefas subjetivas que o presidente Xi Jinping elecou vão ser é, realizadas. Porque eu acho que ela vai impactar no mundo inteiro e também no meu país. Né? Porque a China encontrou um jeito, com características de desenvolvimento com características chinesas. E, eu, e, e ele fala muito, por exemplo, na questão da segurança. E isso quer dizer um monte de coisa, porque a gente também tem que ter, eu acho, humildade para entender a China. É, são, é um outro código, né? eu sou comunicadora, a gente lê as coisas por meio de símbolos. Os símbolos na China são diferentes do meu. Então, eu acho que a mídia, para ela cobrir bem a China, ela tem que ter primeiro humildade, baixar a bola e escutar mais do que falar. A gente tem muito para aprender com a China. E o, e o primeiro é você ter respeito como jornalista e jamais colocar a China dentro de uma caixinha que você compara com o Ocidente. Não dá para comparar. Eu não estou dizendo que a China tem que ser o um exemplo para o Brasil. Não é isso. O Brasil tem a própria história, o próprio contexto, e os chineses mostraram isso. Os chineses eles pegaram o marxismo, transformaram numa ferramenta com características próprias. Vocês são uma, uma civilização de 5 mil anos. Então, eu cansei da arrogância ocidental de olhar a China e o Oriente de um modo geral, porque a gente não entende. Então, a gente quer enquadrar a sociedade chinesa dentro daquela caixinha liberal e a China não cabe dentro daquela caixinha. A China é muito maior. E eu até brinco com o, o Marcos que quanto mais a gente conhece a China, mais, menos a gente sabe sobre a China. E mais a gente se surpreende. No meu caso, positivamente. Eu, eu estou muito, muito ansiosa, muito curiosa para acompanhar os próximos cinco anos do país. So I'm just wondering, so before you came to China, uh, you, what you heard about China from either the news or the books, and then you came to China and see for yourself, see with your own eyes, did you have, did you spot any differences? Muito, e eu vou falar um pouco da minha pesquisa que eu faço, que eu sou uma marxista que estuda moda. Então eu vejo que a moda, o jeito que as pessoas se vestem, ela expressa o espírito do tempo. Tem um livro muito famoso no Brasil, do Enfio, 
quando ele veio aqui, justamente logo depois da reforma e abertura do presidente Deng Xiaoping, e ele descreve que as roupas das pessoas eram escuras, cinzas, né, todas parecidas, ninguém aderia à moda. Era um país pobre, um país que estava começando a reforma e abertura. Quando eu cheguei em Beijing, Beijing, olha você, cara, você é linda, fashion, sabe, colorida. Então, o comunismo é bonito, o comunismo é, é sexy, o comunismo é diverso, as pessoas são simpáticas, sabe? Porque o estereótipo que se cria no Ocidente é que na China só tem robô, né? Que todo mundo é igual, todo mundo obedece o mesmo padrão, todos têm o mesmo corte de cabelo. Aquela bobajada, né? Mas você vê que é uma cidade cosmopolita, é uma cidade colorida, é uma cidade com pessoas interessantes, né? E de gente comum, gente que quer ser feliz, gente que quer ter sua casa, quer ter seus amores, só isso. Então a difer... é uma diferença que você, eu acho que você vivendo aqui, acho que a única diferença que você vê do capitalismo para o socialismo, e é uma grande diferença, é que aqui o governo trabalha para o povo. No meu país, no modelo ocidental, trabalha para o capital. Acho que, em síntese, essa é a principal diferença. E eu já nunca acreditei né, na cobertura, tanto é que eu acabei vindo parar na China porque eu sempre questionei essa abordagem. E eu só vim aqui mesmo para comprovar com os meus próprios olhos. Assim, eu sou apaixonada pela China. Acho um lugar incrível. I love your country. <risos> Thank you. And, um... Please tell more stories about here to people in Brazil. So right now, I think what we see is mainly the economic exchanges, cooperation between China and Brazil. But I think what really needs is the cultural exchanges, people to people exchanges. As you mentioned, I think probably most people in Brazil probably don't have a, a idea, any idea about China, what China is, what, what it looks like. But I probably the same here. Uh, most people in China probably have no idea what Brazil is like, what people in Brazil are like. So we need more cooperations, cultural exchanges, people to people yeah. exchanges like this, yes. right? Yes. <laughs> and uh, maybe my last question, uh, just how Lula's win, how Lula as the new president of Brazil will change the China-Brazil relations. As I mentioned earlier, these two countries are the biggest economies in their respective regions, the most populous re uh, country in these regions as well. And they are the members of BRICS. Uh, Brazil is the B in BRICS, China is the C in BRICS. And uh, so if these two countries work together, it will have a huge impact to probably the, the whole world. So I'm wondering how will Lula's win? change China and Brazil's relations? Maybe start from you, Marco? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is absolutely true. I mean, uh, Lula already said many times in the last months that if I win the elections, we are going to go back to BRICS at full steam. Because Brazil is there. It's not that Brazil left BRICS. So Lula already said we are committed to uh, strengthen BRICS again. So this this will happen in the next in the next months. So. I think this is, a, this is a very important thing. Second thing, of course, as I told you, CELAC, which is also, uh, it's, it, I mean, it's uh, coordination with BRICS, and I would say even coordination with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, where China is also part, together with Russia, and uh, the economic, the Euro-Asian Economic Union, which with the countries of Central Asia plus Russia. So we, we can see in the last, especially in the last years, there is a lot of uh, this, this regional platform, international platforms are getting uh, uh, stronger because the countries are realizing that the Global South need to be more organized uh, to deal with the challenges we have ahead. So I think this is the, the, the first thing. And I would say there's also it's, I mean, there's already this discussion about expanding the BRICS. Also yesterday, the, the former foreign ministry, Celso Mourinho, already said that Brazil also supports the expansion of BRICS. And there's a lot of countries, right, applying. Argentina applied, mm -hmm. Arge uh, Algeria applied, uh, Turkey is talking about applying. There's many countries already, Saudi Arabia also already. <laughs> So you see that there's a, there's a big awareness that the, the countries must, this platform must be expanded. And one thing that I was thinking we were talking about these last days is that it's also interesting to see, I mean, we are living, this is a, 
sort of a historical crossroads that we're living now, especially for the Global South. It's the time that the next years, either the Global South, we are gonna keep being under the domination of the Western powers, or we're gonna raise and we're gonna try to build a different world, a multipolar world. So, and everything is happening in October. So this might be another <laughs> red October. <laughs> And remember, we had a red October in 1917 in Russia. We had a red October in China because foundation of uh, People's Republic of China was October 1st. Uh -huh. And no. we mouth. It's a very important month. Exactly. So maybe this is another red October that will change the world. We don't know. Let's see. Yes. <laughs> I want to see. Tell. Yes, yes. <laughs> Okay, so uh, very glad to have you guys to share your experience, to share your view. I know you guys, uh, the leftists from Brazil, uh, they probably don't represent all Brazilian peoples, but their voices, their opinions uh, definitely cannot be neglected because uh, like 50, over 50% supported Lula, 60 million votes from the working class voted him. So your, your views definitely need to be heard. So we don't know what can happen in the next few months, but we pray for all the best to Brazil and China-Brazil relations. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.